love the chase and the hunt And I set the pace when I'm running I always take what I want and I always give it 100 Don't need a bank, no I'm funded Play the game like it's nothing I'm always thankful for something Don't take for granted, stay humble Now wake up, it's time to look at the enemy Hi everybody and welcome to my channel In this episode I'm going to be talking about my journey Through the prison system From when I first went to jail at the age of 20, right up until this current year after me recall. And in this journey, I'm also going to be talking about people that I've met along the way, and more so the people that I met in Franklin High Security Prison, because I know after the last video that I've done, I got good reviews, good comments and good feedback about the people I met whilst I was in Franklin Prison. And a lot of years were asking for part two. But before I get into it, I just want to say a massive thank you to all my Patreon members who have joined my Patreon and gained exclusive access to my Discord channel, which has got a private community in and ongoing discussions, daily motivation, daily prison updates, and all sorts of different channels in amongst it. So if you are wanting to join it and support the channel, Click the link in the description and you will become a member and gain that access. And also a thank you to all my subscribers. I'm over 51,000 subscribers at the minute and it's going up at an increasing rate. And I'm really, really happy with the way that it's going. The channel is just going from strength to strength. And that's all down to you lot for subscribing and watching me content. So I'll start by talking about when I first went into the prison system at 20 year old. So at 20 year old, I was in that mindset still that I wasn't asked about prison. I wanted to have that reputation in the area. I wanted to have that name. I wanted to be known as someone who was a force to be reckoned with within the local area. And this was all built up in my mind from a young age, looking up to people around us, people that I thought were role models, but were obviously role models, but in the wrong type of way. So because of the area that I grew up in, and my surroundings, and the people that I looked up to who had been to prison, they'd been in trouble. Um, so from that young age, ultimately in my mind, I wanted to go to prison. And that's what I ended up getting. But I ended up getting more than what I bargained for when I ended up with an IPP for my first sentence. But again, be careful what you wish for because it comes back on you tenfold. Um, so when I was 20 and I got remanded into custody, I went up into Castington Young Offenders, which is now Northumberland. And I spent two months up there. But those two months that I was up there, it was it was just sort of finding my feet. I wasn't scared when I went in there. I was there with a lot of excitement, a lot of anxious, and more so excitement in a strange sort of way. Because a lot of people that were going to prison for the first times would be they wouldn't be full of excitement, they'd be full of anxiety and dread, not wanting to go there. But me, on the other hand, because I wanted to go there from that young age and I wanted to be like me. My pals will be the ones that have been to prison. I wanted to be like the people that I looked up to. I was in the back of the paddy wagon on the way there, bopping away thinking I finally made it. In my head, in that fantasy land that was up here at that young age, I'm like thinking like I've made it. I'm on my way. Let's go. Let's have it. So obviously when I get there, I know the sort of the dynamics about what happened in prison because I've been brought up around it. And like I say, my life was destined for prison because of my environment that I grew up in. And um, so obviously when I went there, like I've mentioned, the dynamics, I knew what sort of things would be happening in the prison. I knew that you were going to be getting tested. And I knew that you had to stand your ground. And I knew you had to stand up for yourself. Otherwise, you'll become a victim of the prison. And you'll be bullied and you'll be getting took advantage of by all the other lads. So on these encounters that happened to me whilst I was in there at that young age, well, you can only imagine what happened when people were coming up, trying to test us, messing on with us. There was one lad that uh, tried to trip us up when I was going for a shower one day. 
and he put his foot out on purpose to trip us up and just to see me reaction. But he didn't get the reaction that he wanted. He got the absolute reverse because when he put his foot out, tripped us up. I just jumped up. Well, I didn't jump up actually because I was standing up and he, he tripped. And I didn't actually fall, but I turned around, put it on him, said, like, let's get it on, get in the showers and go to fucking give you it. Not that way, I mean, not that way in the showers because, yeah. <laughs> but what I meant was I'm going to like give you it in the showers so let's get in, let's go and get it on. But um, that was sort of a test for me and I passed the test. Because the lad turned around and said, "Oh, calm down, I'm only joking. I don't want to. I don't want to fight with you. I was just carrying on. I didn't mean to upset you." So obviously, from then on, the lads that were watching, they all knew not to mess because obviously I wasn't that. I just take it because it was another lad that I landed with on that same day. I landed into the prison system, sorry, on that day, and it was his first time in. And when he was getting tested, he wasn't reacting the way that I was. So obviously, ultimately, he started becoming a victim. People were taking the piss out of him, picking on him. And uh, obviously, it's not very nice to see when things like that's happening. But obviously, I had myself to look after. So whatever was happening outside of my environment or my circle, I was just wasn't taking any uh, notice of it. I was just letting that go on because that was nothing to do with me. I had my own troubles. I had my own things to sort out. But um, on the first night... When that door slammed, that's when the reality like sets in. I walks in into me pod, the door slams behind you, a big steel door, bang. The screws just slam it, but I think they do it a bit harder on your first night in, just for a bit intimidation. They don't actually slam it, but they like they pull it you and slam your door from the inside. But they grab your door, bang, and they pull it shut, but they make sure it's a big bang. So if you're feeling a bit anxious, you better jump like that. But again, I was just like, looked at him, I was thinking like, what are you doing? You know, like, obviously you can blatantly see they're trying to frighten you by slamming the door. So the door shuts, then the silence sets in. You can hear people on the outside of the windows shouting on at the other, other lads out the windows. But then the silence sets in, you're left with your own thoughts. Then you're thinking like, shit's getting real now. You're, you're stuck in here, that door's locked, you're not getting out. Now you're doing your time properly. You're in prison. You're locked in. The door shut behind you. Now you've got to get on with your time, get your head down, or do whatever you've got to do throughout your sentence. But um, like, like I say, that first night, got my head down, and it was actually the morning after when I woke up the next morning when the anxiety was like setting in because you wake up in the morning, that's even if you do get to sleep, but I did get to sleep that first night. And you wake up in the morning and the anxiety sets in because you don't know what time the door's opening. You don't know what's going to be happening. You don't know whether, well, you haven't got a clue what you're doing. So you're thinking, what's happening? Is the door going to open? The door opens up. You go for an induction, then you're back in your pad. But again, you go out and you're meeting the other lads and you're seeing the other lads. And if you look frightened, if you look, a few have a different type of look on your face other than, like, I'm doing me time. I'm here to get on with it. If anyone messes with us, you're going to see what's going to happen. So the other lads are looking for that. They're looking for weaknesses. They're looking to see if they can find a weakness so they can bully you, intimidate you. And if they do find a weakness, what they'll do is they'll take your canteen, you will take your backy, because at the time, you could smoke still. And I, I smoked at the time, so I was smoking a turner. The fifth 50 gram packets attorney used to buy on the canteen. I can't remember exactly how much it was. Or was a half ounce, sorry, 25 gram a baggy. I think they were about five pounds or something like that at the time. And um, so if you don't stick up for yourself and you are a smoker, you will get them took off you, and that's what's going to happen, especially on like I say, your first time in. But I was up that prison for two months, I had a few more altercations after that, nothing too serious, just a bit fighting put down in front of the governor, um, put on CC, put behind me door for 14 days, no TV, no nothing. You're allowed out your pad for 20 minutes to go and get a shower once a day. You'd Like I say, you go back to your pad and you're just lying there, looking at the four walls. But luckily, I knew a couple of lads on the wing because um, I got moved wings after I'd had another altercation with someone. I had another fight on the wing and I got moved to another wing. And I knew a couple of lads on there from back of my area. 
So what they done was, when I got my door opened up to go for a shower, they ran in and give us a high fi put the high fi under my bed, so when the screws come back, shut the door, lock me in, I get the hi fi out and I can listen to a bit of music. So that was a saviour, that, because stuck in that nearly 24 hours a day for two weeks with no TV was a challenging time when you're first time in prison, you've only been in a week. But again, I just wasn't bothered. I just listened to my music, zoned out, and just going off, drifting off into my own thoughts. But um, I also got a couple of magazines chucked under the door. But at the time, if anyone remembers, it was the Nuts magazines and the Zoo magazine. So I'd read that from back to front, front to back, twice over, just to pass the time. So moving on from there, when I went down to Durham prison, I was in there for six months. I think it was four months, sorry. And then what happened was after four months, my trial didn't go ahead they, um, because of a couple of witnesses didn't turn up. So the trial didn't go ahead. And I got out on what's called GSEs, Judge and Chambers. So I got out and I was out for two months. Because what happens if you are in prison, it's changed a bit now with the COVID and everything. But when you, if you were in prison for six months and they hadn't had you on trial in that time or done anything with you without any, any, what can I say, without any proper evidence, then they had to, to give you like what's called GSEs, Judge and Chambers, where your barrister goes and talks to the judge in the chambers um, and the barrister will come up and tell you whether or not the judges give you bail. So the come and tell us I had judge and chambers. It was on a Friday, I remember. Again, remember I was only 21 because I just turned 21 whilst I was in Caston when I was in there, uh, went to transfer to Durham. And I remember ringing my mates up saying, oh, come and pick us up. I'm getting out tonight. So they come and picked us up. I wasn't there tonight. Actually, it was like afternoon time. It was mid-afternoon. So the first thing I'd done when I was at the edge, all I was thinking about was drink. So you get out. And this is what everyone, most, the majority of the prison population talk about. Can't wait for the first day out so then get out, get back on the drink. So that was my mentality still at that point. But I was getting out after spending six months in prison. And I didn't get out all cocky thinking, oh, I've been to prison with a chip on my shoulder thinking I'm hard. I just got out and just carried on as normal the way I was. And um, I was out for two months, went back up for trial, Ended up getting found guilty, got sentenced to four years IPP, which was an indefinite sentence for public protection, which technically is a 99-year sentence. And I got that at 21-year-old. And that's what I was saying at the beginning of the video. Be careful what you wish for. I got that at 21-year-old for two violent offences. Um, and it's definitely not what I wished for. Obviously, I wanted to go to prison but I didn't think I'd be going to prison for that long or for that amount of time or that size sentence, like an indefinite sentence. Because in Durham, outside your pads, you used to have name cards next to your door and it would have your name, your number and your sentence on. So obviously mine was Ricky Colleen. I remember the prison, everyone remembers the prison numbers. MB6736, 99 years. And I remember standing on the railings looking over down onto the rail landings couple of lads walking past and were like looking at everyone's cards. They walked past mine and they were like, wow, look at that one, 99 years. Who's that? I wonder who's in there. And I was like, yeah, that's me. And they were like, well, I wouldn't want to be you. And I'm like, in my head, I still wasn't really that bothered because I hadn't really, really deep down known what the IPP was. But I, I was aware of it. And then every time I mentioned to someone what sentence I was doing, because every time you get talking to somebody in prison, the first thing they'll say is, oh, how long are you doing? So when you see IPP, everyone was like, oh, IPP, feel so sorry for you. But every time someone said that, it was just feeling worse and worse and worse. And then in my head, I'm just saying, no, I'll be out after four. And I'm not worrying about the other things because they're all saying you're going to be in 10, 15 years. <laughs> but I was thinking to myself, no, I'm not going to be in that long. Um, but that's technically... You could have been in 99 years off this IPP. There's lads in now on two-year tariffs or even less than two-year tariffs, and they're in 15, 16, 17 years later, still stuck in there now, fighting to get out. But, um, so when I went back into Durham, I think I was back in there for about another four months. 
No, another six months, sorry, because I think altogether I've spent 10 months in Durham. So I've done another six months there before I got transferred over to Franklin Prison. And this is where I'll start mentioning people who I met and who I come across because before I got there, there wasn't really many people out of the ordinary where there was in Franklin because in Cassington, in Durham, with them being remand prisons, also it's still sentence prison as well, Cassington, but they held remand prisoners and Durham being a Cat B local prison. It used to be a Category A prison, Durham, with a unit in, but um, it's a Cat B local prison. And you don't really meet, like I've just mentioned, anyone out of the ordinary because you may come across the odd one or two, but compared to a prison like Franklin, which is a Category A, which holds Category B prisoners as well, a high security prison, also known as a dispersal prison. And there's only five dispersal prisons in the country, which holds the most dangerous and violent offenders throughout the country. So when you get there, that's when it's like a different, a total different dynamics, total different kettle of fish. You get to that prison and you're meeting people that you'll actually used to see in the news on documentaries and um, serial killers, hitmen. You get there and it's like, fuck, like this is real. They, these are real big time gangsters. You're now living amongst the worst of the worst. Or you could also see the cream of the crop, the way people used to look at them because these were big high end gangsters from every city in the country across, the, across England, even Scottish, Irish. There's people from all over the world are met in Franklin. There was people, there was lads from Brazil. Russia, um, where else from? There was a f fella from Colombia. And the fella from Colombia, I'll just talk a little bit about him. He's He was actually called Jesus. I think it was or Hermendez, someone like that. I can't remember exactly his name. And he was doing a massive sentence for, as you can guess, from Colombia, cocaine importation. So he was importing huge amounts of coke into England. And he was part of the Colombian cartel. And like I mentioned, his name was Jesus. And if you Google it up, you can't find him on Google. And one Christmas, he was sitting at the head of the table, unintentionally sitting at the head of the table. And there was another 12 people sitting around the table. And one of the lads actually pointed it out and said, have you seen that? And without him realizing, they had Jesus at the head of the table on Christmas Day, these were all, all these lads were on a food boat together. So they're all cooking food and had their own Christmas dinner with Jesus sat at the head of the table. How ironic. <laughs> but I don't even think that actually realized it until someone pointed out that the whole wing was laughing the back off. It was quite, quite a funny moment. But um, yes, so there was the likes of him. There was a Russian lad who was over on J Wing and uh, he was in for important Kalashnikovs, AK 47s from obviously from Russia over into the UK and he was doing a massive sentence as well um, I think there was two of them but I only met, met one of them because he used to come to the gym all the time he looked like a bit of a soldier type he was had like an athletic build he was only late 20s and uh, he was uh, like I mentioned he was doing a massive sentence as well for important guns from Russia into the UK so as I go along, I'm just going to mention other people that pop into my head because as I mentioned him, another lad popped into my head um, from down Manchester who was Warren. He was also nicknamed Waza. And I maybe should have looked this up. I, I can't remember his second name, but Warren was in prison with his dad. Warren and his dad were doing big, big wrecks. I think it was 25 and 30 years tariffs, life sentence with a recommendation of 30 years for murder. And Warren and his dad had allegedly, I'm not sure exactly the ins and outs of the case. Sometimes I'll say allegedly because a lot of these lads are still appealing their set, wait, appealing the convictions. So I can't come on here and say he done this or, or he done that. I'm only saying 
what I know of when I met them in there and telling you what they were in for. So they were in for a murder. And I think it was something to do with being in a big, big gangland feud. Someone was after Warren, and Warren allegedly didn't uh, didn't stand for it. And I think the lad ended up getting shot. And him and his dad allegedly put him in the back of the trunk of his car, took him away, and they uh, disposed of his body. But obviously it all come on top for them. They got found out, and then they got lifed off, and they got sent to Franklin. So Warren and his dad were in Franklin together at the time. But I believe Warren's dad has actually passed away now. So there's just Warren left serving the sentence. Because Warren was, he wasn't much older than me at the time. I was 21. He was a few years older than me, I believe. And uh, his dad was quite, well, he seemed quite old at the time. But um, <clears throat> I met Warren when I was doing the ATS course. And the ATS course is, the initials stand for Enhanced Thinking Skills. So this is a course that they put you on to sort of make you, make it also look at your crime, but also to give you these skills to, en to enhance your thinking skills. The course has been changed a few times, a few different names. I think one of them was Stop. And it's now been, it's now called the TSP, the Thinking Skills Program. Because what they do with these courses when they've been running for so long, and it looks as if they're coming to the end of the expiry date of these courses, where sometimes they're looked upon as if they're not working anymore. So then they'll change the course. And it's still exactly the same, but all they've done is change the name just so it looks as though the they've created another course and they'll give that one a try. So the enhanced thing in the ATS course, I remember doing that one and it lasted around about, I think it was 12 weeks. And you'd done this course nearly every day and you had to do role players. And this was quite daunting for a first time coming on a course like this because there was maybe about 15 of you in the room doing this course. And you had to do a lot of different um, written work. And you also, they would come around the room and ask you individually, what was it you've just done? What have you wrote? And what was your thoughts on this? So you've got to sit there and tell the rest of the group what your thoughts were on this specific situation that they've given you. And you had to do role plays. So for me, Every time, like if I get in a, if I'm in a nervous situation, I get a nervous laugh and I start laughing, I start giggling. So I had to come up with the front of the room and do a role play with this other lad. And we had to role play that while we're having a fight in a bar. So I'm at the bar and this lad who I was doing the role play with had to come in and pretend he was going to have a fight with us and argue with us. But he's come pulling in the room, and pretend I'm at the bar and he's come in and he's shouting on, and I just can't stop laughing because I'm that nervous. And the way that he's come in, he was like being dead serious. And then I just started laughing me back off because I couldn't control the laughter because I was also nervous. And this kept, we kept going on for about, we had to do the, the, like a retake about six times until we got it right. Because every time you come bursting through the door and they start shouting on, I couldn't stop laughing. But the rest of the group's laughing. But then before people were coming in, before I was even laughing, Everyone else started laughing when he come walking in because they were anticipating me laughing. But um, like I say, it took about six times to get that right. But that was where I first met Warren on that course. And this is what I mean about when you meet people, like the impressions you get sometimes of people. Looking at Warren, you would never think he was that type of person. Like he didn't look like your typical gangster or gangbanger. And when he come, when I met him, he's like polite. And he just looked like, he didn't look like a typical person like that, like Hitman or someone that's went and shot somebody, killed somebody and took them away. Not that you do get your typical looking person, but you know what I mean, someone with an attitude, a swagger, um, typical gangster shouting on or whatever. Warren wasn't like that. He was just a quiet lad. I got on with his time and didn't bother anybody. But um, it just goes ashore. Don't judge people on the way they look. And moving on to that, because, like I've said, every time I say something, 
I'm moving on to the next person. When I've said, don't judge a person on the way he looks, I'll go on to talk about little Tommy. So little Tommy was about five and a half foot with little glasses on. He worked in the laundry and he had like a bit of a, not a squeaky voice, but a, like a quiet voice. It's hard to describe, but Tommy was friendly, really down to earth fella, got on with everybody. Tommy, Tommy Bork, his name is, um, he was very good friends with Kevin Lane. I think he was in the pod next door to Kev and them two were really good friends. But again, Tommy, like I've mentioned, don't judge people by the way they look. Because someone told us, I said, do you know what he's in for? And again, I'm not talking about his case. I'm just talking about what he was in for because I don't know the ins and outs of the case and some people might be appellants. Don't know the ins and outs exactly, but I'm just saying from what I remember. And they were trying to do something or tax him or tax his business. He was just a law-abiding citizen with his own business. And he's blasted two of them. With a shotgun, I think. But I know he's there. Uh, he's blasted two of them. I can't remember if both of them died. But Tommy got lifed off with a recommendation of 30 years. I might be wrong, but a few lot sitting at home, some people might know Tommy. If the facts aren't right, I'm just saying I'm giving a draft um, explanation of the situation just for the viewers uh, that haven't been to prison and that don't know these people. So Tommy was doing a 30-year life sentence. And this is what I mean by don't... Don't judge a book by its cover because Tommy maybe would look like the type of person that someone would go and bully. And um, Tommy was well respected throughout the high security estate. Everybody who will have been doing time round about then um, in the in the noughties, late nineties, will have known Tommy because, like I've mentioned, he was known throughout the system, not as a fighter or as a hard man or anything like that, but as a decent man. Because there's a few type of people that get through the system and get known through the system. You get the people out of the bullies. Everyone remembers them. Then you get the hard men. Everybody remembers the hard men because obviously they've got a massive name and everyone's heard about them fighting and learn knows not to mess with these type of people. But then you've got the gentlemen like Tommy that everyone gets on with, everyone's friendly with. Everyone, wa everyone wants to have a friend like Tommy just to have a sensible sit down with a cup of tea or a cup of coffee and not sit and talk about gangster crack all day long. You can sit and chill with Tommy. He's a gentleman, and he'll have a laugh with you, and there's no malice in him. So those are the three types of people you get in the prison system that get remembered. The hard men, the bullies, and the gentlemen. And Tommy was the gentleman. But um, there was a few lads from Manchester that were down there. Um, and I'm mentioning one that was in the laundry with Tommy. And he was called Mick. Can't even remember his second name. He was from Manchester, tall, by maybe about six foot, baldy head. He was good friends with Gary Shearer, another armed robber. And Mick was in for armed robbery. But he was another another rare, uh, decent fella that was easy to get on with. And he uh, didn't cause any trouble for anyone. And he was just a normal, a normal fella in the prison system. You might not think he's a normal fella. People on the outside think, well, how can you call him normal? He's an armed robber, a very dangerous one, doing a massive stretch for armed robberies. But in the prison system, when you're in there and you're living amongst these people, people like Mick can be classed as normal. Normal just means they just get on with the time, they do normal things in prison, go to the gym, cook the food, and just get on with the time. And, there, and Gary Shearer, who was a good friend of Mick, another lad from down Manchester, who again was very... Very approachable, very nice lad. He was in for armed robberies. He was category A. And I think he got, when he did, he got released from Franklin as a category A prisoner because the sentence he was doing was a fixed term. He'd been in, I'm sure it was round about coming up to the 10 year mark. He'd been in prison for 10 years and he got released straight from Franklin as a category A prisoner. But I believe he had to go into a hostel from there because that's what happens sometimes. If you get released as Category A prisoner, you have to go to the hostels. But Gary, another one, was there just trim, lean, used to go to the gym all the time, looked after himself, didn't bother with the, 
any of the jail politics or taking drugs or anything like that. He just got on with his time. And yeah, he was another uh, another another lad that's you can class as a gentleman in prison. Um, and like I've mentioned, in prison terms, because obviously people on the outside won't look at the likes of us that were in there as gentlemen. But prison dynamics, the class as gentlemen, like myself when I was in there, just got on with my time, went to the gym, didn't bother anyone. Um, I'm not one of them names that would people would remember throughout the system because I didn't cause any bother. But the lads like Gary, people like that, and Tommy, Kevley and all them, they'll all remember me name because they'll remember me. I was a decent lad that got on with his time, didn't cause any grief for anyone, and used to sit down and have cuppers with these lads and just got on with my time. Anything just to get through your sentence, past the years, ready to get it back out onto the streets, back into release. Um, and another, I'm going to mention some Geordie lads and some Macam lads because I've never really mentioned the Geordie lads before and I've been speaking on here. Um, but some of the other Geordie lads, who was uh, Beefy. A lot of lads in the system will remember Beefy. He's an armed robber from Newcastle. And he got on with everyone, just got on with his time. But these, obviously, when you're in Franklin for armed robbery, these armed robberies are like, obviously, gunpoint robberies where the lads are like taking like massive amounts of money from either booties, cash machines, uh, different things like that. They're not just mediocre robberies, uh, robbing like shops for bottles of drink and bottles sleeves of tabs. These are like big time robberies and that's why they end up in Franklin because the high, high way well, not high risk but the high profile cases on the outside and uh, Beefy just got on with everyone. He was fine. Didn't uh, cause no trouble for nobody and um, <clears throat> who was the other one I was just going to mention there. I was going to mention talking about armed robberies Mark Deer. So Mark Deer was from over Wall's End and Mark was a funny chap. He got on with everybody. And the reason why I'm saying was and referring to him as the past tense is because since prison, Mark's actually passed away. Rest his soul. He, um, in front, Mark, I'll just tell you what he was in for. Mark and another two lads, Jimmy and... Oh, what was the other lad? Jimmy and his brother, uh, Richardson. They, all of them were in together for robberies. They were robbing... Night gar like garages on a nighttime fuel garages. They were going and cutting the cash machines out the side, um, and doing gunpoint robberies. And they were doing, I think they got about ten to twelve years, and that's why Mark ended up in Franklin. But Mark was a, a witty fella. He made everyone laugh, and he was like, you got like the Joker types in prison as well, where they just make everyone laugh. And they like to be just going on daft all the time and just having a laugh, and that's how they get through their sentence. Because obviously you've got the lads that take the drugs to get through the sentence. The lads that go to the gym. Mark went to the gym now, but Mark was the one that got through his time by getting on with people, but making people laugh and just having that type of uh, humour about them. But in Franklin, at the time when I was in with him, he had behind his ear what he thought was a little blackhead, and it was actually a cancerous mole. And I remember he went on a visit, and he was getting his lass, he was getting his girlfriend to try and squeeze it, which was probably aggravating it and making it even worse. So Mark got transferred to Loudoun Grange from there. And when they took him to the hospital, because in Franklin, the healthcare in the prison system was absolutely atrocious. He wasn't getting no help. He went down to see the doctors. The doctors were fobbing him off. He got to Loudoun Grange, which is a private nick. The doctors took one look at it, took him straight to the outside hospital, and the poor fucker ended up getting his ear cut off. He, they took his full ear off, went back to the prison thinking that he'd getting rid of the cancer. He got released not long after, but the cancer had come back, or the cancer had actually spread. It hadn't come back. It hadn't actually gone. They took his ear off, and the cancer had actually spread. And it went through into his head, and he ended up having another operation where it cut all of his cheek out and everything, and his face was all squashed up. But it still didn't get rid of it. It went into his brain. And uh, actually, his sister got in touch with us, actually went to his funeral. And uh, it was obviously a sad time. But again, Mark was a, a lovely chap and he didn't deserve that. If the prison system had looked after him properly, the health care, then he would still be here now. Because all that would have happened is that little tiny cancerous mole that was behind his ear, if that was cut out in time, he would have lived. If he knew it was cancerous, he probably would have just cut it off himself in prison just to get rid of it. 
but because they'd left them that long, it spread and it was too late. But um, yes, so that was some of the Geordies. And uh, another little Geordie fella I'll mention because he's worth mentioning because he's uh, he was a good fella. He was just like the rest I've just mentioned. He didn't cause any bother for anyone. Got on with his time and that was uh, Peter Wallace. Well, Peter Wallace was in doing a, a big old stretch. He was in for doing it for drugs. And uh, Peter Peter ended up being, I think he was Jim Orderly. And he just got on with his time by doing fitness. He was an absolute fitness fanatic. Fit as anything. On the, uh, he just got on with his sentence. And he just got, got through his sentence by training constantly. On the, uh, so uh, those are the Geordie lads I'll mention. On the, uh, some of the Mackham lads... I mentioned um, on the last one, I mentioned Apple, who was from Pennywell. And anyone who's from up in the northeast will have heard of the Pennywell estate over in Sunderland, which was the roughest estate in Sunderland. And uh, that's now been knocked down. Not, uh, well, the street's been knocked down because it was that rough. But Apple, he was from Pennywell. And then you had, uh, you had Danny Rear, who was uh, from over the same end, because him and Apple were good pals. But Danny was uh, a fitness fanatic as well. He used to love his uh, training. And um, I'll mention another one, uh, Wayne Gates, because Wayne was in the pad opposite me. And Wayne was doing a life sentence for murder. But Wayne got on with his time, didn't cause anyone any trouble. And he was a rare, uh, he was a likable character. And he's a, uh, he was a, uh, one of those that just got on with his time as well, didn't want to cause any trouble. Got through his time the best way he could by keeping his head down and not causing any grief. And uh, I think Wayne progressed through the system quite quite good. I think he went to, was a golf or golf tree after Franklin. But um, and I've mentioned on the last on the last video that I've done about the Franklin inmates or the, the ones that I come across in Franklin, obviously Colin Gunn, Andy Shack, Warren Slaney. And those were the three, and Kevin Lean and Gary Nelson. Those were the five main ones of the top dogs that I would say, the ones that I met whilst in there. They were the ones with the biggest names in the system, all five of them. But I've already spoke about them, so I'll not go into it on this one. And the, um, the maddest one, or the maddest person, or the craziest looking one I ever met was I mentioned a little bit about him on the last one, was David Bieber. Because a couple of people said he was the craziest person you've ever met, or the maddest. And it'll have had to be David Bieber. David Bieber is the American bodybuilder that killed the police officer on Boxing Day down in Leeds. And uh, he shot him at point-blank range in the head when he was on his hands and knees begging for his life. Now, even the lads that were in front and the hardened criminals, they all said, like, it was shocking what he'd done. Like, the police officer was on his hands and knees, begging for his life. And he could have easily still made his escape. And there was no need to pull that trigger when he was on the floor begging for his life. Like, there was no need for him to do it. But the reason behind him doing that was because he was wanted in America for murder. So he thought... This was the reason why he was getting stopped. It wasn't the reason why he got stopped. He got pulled over for a random search. But when they were doing checks on him, he was in fear that he was going to be extradited back to America. And the prisons in America, compared to the English prisons, are absolutely brutal. So he's took it on himself to end this police officer's life, knowing that he would have to do his time in this country and he wouldn't be transferred or extradited over to America. And that was the reason why he'd done what he'd done. But when I met him in the gym, because David was over on B-Wing, when I, uh, sorry, G-Wing, when I was on F-Wing, and the two wings were the only wings that mixed together in the gym at the time, because it was only F and G-Wing, which was normal location. So we used to mix in the gym together. And when I met him in the gym, he had this look about him where, you just knew, and he had this aura and this this feeling about him where you just looked at him and thought, I'll keep out the way of him because you know he's a dangerous fella, obviously what he's in for. But he didn't really have any friends as such in Franklin Prison because I think he was quite arrogant um, and he didn't really 
like I've mentioned, he didn't really get along with many people. Not that he had any trouble with people, but they just gave him a wide berth, probably because he looked like such a psychopath as well. On the eyes, he's, he's the, there was no colour in, in his eyes. His eyes were just black, like shark eyes. And he's one of the only fellas that I've seen, or from another lad who I'll mention later on, who I've looked at, and his eyes were just gone. He just The blackness of his eyes, and he just looked like an absolute lunatic. And uh, he actually got Colin Gunn into a bit of trouble in Franklin when this had nothing to do with Colin Gunn. Now, just for the viewers that don't know who Colin Gunn is, Colin Gunn is a big, notorious gangster from Nottingham who's doing life with a recommendation of 35 years for two murders. And uh, Colin was just getting on with his time over on G-Wing. And David Bieber had got access to a phone. So he had a mobile phone in his pad. And I remember this being all over the news of the world. Obviously, the news of the world is no longer. But on a Sunday, this newspaper used to come out. And David Bieber was hatching on a scare plot from Franklin Prison with a smuggled-in mobile phone. So on a night time when he's in his pad, it, it, even though he was cut here high risk, but he had a banana suit on, he was on the phone talking to his friend or who he thought was his friend, and he was saying to him, he was, his escape plot was, go and hire or go get a helicopter ride because you can pay to get like a helicopter ride. So he was saying to his friend, I'll give you the money. I'll give you £50,000 if you go get a helicopter ride, hijack the helicopter, fly over the prison yard when he's on exercise and drop the ladder down. And he said, if any of the screws try to stop us, lay the fire down. Because he was telling them where he had guns stashed. And he was saying, if the screws try to stop him getting on the rope to climb up or onto the ladder to climb up into the helicopter, lay a fire down onto the yard, onto the screws. But his friend on the outside must have thought, or thought to myself, how much of an actual psychopath are you asking me to do this? So what he's went and done is, he's give the, or he sold the phone to the news of the world. And he said, again, I'm going to pass you on to my friend who he'll speak to about the escape plot. And I think they actually had his, his voice on the videotape. I'm going to see if I can hunt it out on YouTube, actually. And I'll actually do another separate video on it and I'll put it on. But um, what he'd done was, he was speaking to this person who he thought was going to help him escape from Franklin Prison, when in fact it was the reporter of the News of the World, and he was giving all this information out over the phone, and he said, me, he, he said, there's me and a friend, and I don't know who his friend was, but it wasn't Colin Gunn. So Colin Gunn got roped him with this and the thought that he was the other person. So Colin and David Bieber got put on the unit, I think it was in Woodhill, they got put on the unit together in Wood Hill, and there was only those two on the unit at the time. High risk, category A prisoners. And they were in banana suits, and they spent a substantial amount of time together on this unit, and they didn't speak to each other because Colin had fell out with David for putting him in this situation when it had nothing to do with him. And it took Colin a long time for the for to make the authorities realize that he had nothing to do with it. I believe it was about 18 months what he suffered on that unit in a banana suit before they put him back into the mainstream prisons. And he went back to Franklin, I believe. Well, that was all to do with David Bieber on the, uh, getting Colin into trouble for something that had nothing to do with him. But um, that was how crazy he was. He was offering £50,000 for a helicopter escape and to lay down fire on the screws if anyone tries to uh, intervene or stop him from happening. Well, luckily for everyone involved, it got passed to the uh, the news of the world who actually passed it on to the authorities. But I believe his friend who passed the phone on got a substantial amount of money for doing that. He probably bargained with them and said, I'm going to get £50,000 for the escape plot. So can you match or do more than that deal? They probably got a lot more than the 50000 But those are, uh, he was the maddest or the craziest looking one that I come across. And uh, I'll just, before I move on, I'll just talk about uh, another lad who was, who had eyes like that as well. And that was uh, Chrissy Ashton from down Liverpool. Now, Chrissy and his brother were both doing a life sentence for a murder down in Liverpool. 
And I think they were doing recommendations of 25 years. And Chrissy, Chrissy was the older brother. Tommy was the younger. And I think Tommy was about the same age as me. Chrissy was a few years older than me. So they were only like 21 or maybe he's 24, something like that at the time. And uh, Chrissy and Tommy, a uh, couple of scouses that had their own scouse firm at the time. Because all the scouses stuck together. All the monks stuck together. The Geordies. And then you had different groups that used to all have their own. It wasn't called gangs. It wasn't called groups or anything. It was called a clique. So you all had your own little cliques. And uh, Chrissy, obviously Chrissy and Tommy, had their own little clique. But um, they got on with... When I was in, in the time that I was there, I've heard different since. Um, but the time I was there, they, they had no trouble with anybody. Yeah, they got on with for the time. They didn't take any shit, especially Chrissy, because since I left Franklin and Chrissy got moved on different places, I've heard quite a few stories, especially like I've heard in the new, I think he was in the in the papers. Something had happened at another prison. Um, I'll not go into it too much because I'm not sure the exact details. But people have been seriously hurt throughout the prison system um, involving or allegedly involving Chrissy Ashton. But Chrissy was one of those when it, you looked at him, his eyes were like black, had like shark eyes. And even though he was a nice fella in prison, I always re refer to it in prison because everyone out here will think, well, how is he a nice fella? But when you're in prison, the dynamics of prison, you go off prison the way it is and you talk about the way it was as if it's a normal society. Because once you're in there, you're living a normal life in prison. So Chrissy was one of those lads that was there. Uh, like just a normal lad, one no, one of the normal lads on the wings, and didn't uh, cause any any trouble in the time that I was there. There wasn't a lot of trouble in Franklin in the time that I was there. There was a few incidents that were very serious that went off big time. But um, apart from those few incidents over the three years that I was actually there, the majority of people, all the different cliques and the groups, all got on with each other, or if they didn't get on, they knew just not to speak with each other and just have sort of neutral ground and just get on with the time because that was the best way to do your time in them high security prisons is just get on with your time, forget about whatever where, whatever else is going on unless someone comes and rains on your parade and tries to muscle in on your group or try to intimidate you or anything like that, then people stand the ground and things happen. But uh, yes, that was uh, Chrissy and Tommy, Tommy. Again, like I say, they didn't, or he didn't cause any trouble when I was there, and they just got on with the time. But um, again, not the type of people that you want to be messing with, especially in the high security prison. So, um, so when I moved on from there, I went up to Northumberland, and I was up there for another year before I was released. But Northumberland, going from Franklin High Security up to, it wasn't Northumberland, it was actually Acklington. It's now classed as Northumberland because Castleton and Acklington got merged into one big prison. But going up to there, Category C prison from a Category A high security was a massive culture shock because you're in amongst people that are just nothing like the ones that you've just been living with for the previous three years. There are um, a lot of them. There's a lot of heavy drug users, a lot of smack, a lot of subbies, and everyone just running around off their heads and it's a lot livelier, it's a lot louder, there's a lot more things happening, but it's uh, because people are just doing short sentences, and there's loads of fighting, there's loads of shouting on, there's loads of, everyone's hyper on association, there's a hundred people out on social, everyone's running around, music blasting, MCing, and it's just totally different compared to what you've just been to. And, uh, but obviously people used to look at you in a certain way when they heard that you just come from Franklin, because me and another lad, Elliot, who was from Leicester, he was an army lad who was in for robbery. There was the, Me and him went up to Auckland and, and they, uh, obviously were both big lads and everyone was like a bit wary saying, oh, them two have just come from Franklin. So we had that sort of that sort of reputation when we went up there, people were like a bit wary saying, oh, these two big lads have just come from Franklin. So everyone was asking a lot of questions, what's it like in there, who was in there. But again, up in Acklington, you didn't really come across anyone out of the ordinary. There was just, everyone was just, or the whole jail was just a typical Category C. And when I mentioned there was, it was more lively, there was more fights. The alarm bells was going off a lot more. 
because there wasn't as many stabbings as what you would get in high security or not as or the violence wasn't as severe but there was more things happening and i remember on a friday night because i was on a wing because at the time when it's been changed to northumberland the house blocks have all been moved around and i believe all the nonces are up where we all used to be so over on a wing and you had f and g wing opposite f and g wings used to call the bronx wings which were the worst a wing wasn't so bad I think D-Wing was the induction. Then I went on to A-Wing. And on a night time, or on a Friday night, looking out the windows, everyone shouting out the windows, because the windows used to open wide open, and sometimes they didn't shut, and you had a big gap like that, and it would be freezing in the winter. And I remember all the lads chucked stuff out the window, and they were set a fire. And then everyone was chucking mattresses out, chucking all sorts out. There was a massive bonfire in the middle of the prison. Everyone shouting out the windows, and it was absolutely mental. And it was just like... You were like took a back thinking this is crazy. This everyone's fucking shouting on a big massive fire in the middle of the jail. Everyone's fucking toasting it as if they're having a big bonfire. And uh, yes, it was lively as out fighting on all the time. And uh, the only lad I remember that was that was a decent lad from up there was Ratty. Now Ratty was, I think he was only doing a couple of years when I met him. Right, he's from over Pennywell Way as well, or the, is it the Ford Estate? I think it's all the classes the same, the Pennywell and the Ford, and uh, over in Sunderland. But well, Ratty was, uh, got on with his time, didn't cause any bother, but if bother come to him, then he would deal with it. And I remember walking around the exercise yard with him one day, because what happened is you had F, G, D and E all out on the exercise together, so you had four wings and this is where a lot of the trouble was starting because everyone was just walking around together, a big massive circle of people just walking round and round, people running from group to group, trying to get drugs, trying to get different things. And uh, some lad was griefing Ratty behind us, shouting, Ratty, are you little plum and I like your little divvy. And Ratty was like, just kept walking on, didn't want nothing to do with it. But then it got to the point where he thought, I'm going to have to deal with this. So he's turned around, Ratty just went up, ba ba bang, smashed him about six times within a second, smashed him all over, splittered him. And, uh, and that was Ratty. Ratty didn't take any shit. But Ratty's now back in doing a 24, I think he's doing a 24-year ADS, and he's got to serve somewhere around about 18 years out of that 24. So I believe it's round about them sort of numbers. Um, and that was for a shooting over in Sunderland. And uh, he was the only one that I really met up there who happened, that was really worth mentioning. And uh, like I've mentioned, he was uh, he was strong as an ox as well, Ratty. He was only a short lad, but he was uh, built like a little bull. And he was smashing the weights out in the gym. He was probably the strongest in there at the time. But then I got released from there in 2010, September 2010. And I stayed out of prison for nine and a half years. But because I'm doing IPP with a life, um, a life license... For 99 years, after nine and a half years, I got recalled back to prison and spent just over 13 months back in. And I went back to Durham. And it was a massive culture shock getting being out after nine and a half years and going back in and seeing the state of some of the people that were in there. Some of the lads that were in the first time I was in, and it was just like, couldn't believe the way some of them were going on, running around for spice. Because the spice epidemic all happened in them nine and a half years that I was out. So when I come back in, I was new to this sort of thing. And you see in the state of some of the people monged out on the spice, totally cabbage. And it was just like unbelievable, some of the things that you've seen. So I'd spent, I was only in Durham for two weeks. And then I got transferred down to Home House where I spent the remainder of my time. Where I'd done nearly 30 months in there. And... um. Again, Home House, that was, it's a Category C prison, but it used to be a Cap B local. And Home House is still run as if it's a Cap B prison. It's absolute, like the restrictions, like the visits, it's it's run like a Cap B prison still. Whereas Cat C prisons, you're supposed to get more, like a better, a more things, more, what can I say, a, um, like, it's not so secure. And you've got Category B, which is more secure. Category C, where you're supposed to get more freedom in the prison and different things. 
But the way that it was run, it was like a category B still. And uh, I was back in there for 13 months on uh, what was I going to mention? I was going to talk about like the spice in there. Some of the lads, are, like the states that I've seen some of the people in there compared to when I was first in, it was just like a total culture shock. I went on a house box five when I first arrived and it's shaped like a, it's a big square. And everyone, it was nicknamed the birdcage because you could see all the way around it. And when I walked down on association, I looked around and I actually thought to myself, have they put me on the hospital wing? That's how bad it was. Some of the people that were in there looking at them out the heads on spice and different things, I was like, couldn't believe my eyes. It felt as if like the clientele or the class of prisoner was just like totally went from like being up there to actually right down there the dregs of society, and that's what it was like. And I was just thinking, what on earth is this? I'm like, I felt as if I was on the hospital wing, and that's all to do with the spice epidemic, the way people are and the act and the behaviours when they're on spice. But I spent 30 months back in there, and that's when I wrote my fitness book, Behind the Bars, Ruthless Fitness, got myself in the best mindset possible, wrote that book. All this was during COVID lockdown. The lockdown happened in two th March 2020, and I'd been in since December 2019. So when we heard it was getting locked down and COVID struck the prison, that's when it started. Well, how can I describe it? Started becoming, for some people, an absolutely depressing shithole. A lot of people went right under when they were locked up nearly 24 hours a day. Sometimes it would go on for 36 hours before you would get out for a shower or exercise. But some of the lads, I couldn't get up on a morning due to medication or whatever. And the exercise was at nine, 8 o'clock in the morning or 9 o'clock. And if they had had their medication the night before, they couldn't get up in the morning because some of them were on very strong antipsychotic tablets where they couldn't get up on a morning. So they would miss their association and they wouldn't get association or a shower for three or four days at a time. But for me, I went in the opposite direction. I changed my mindset and I knew I had to get myself in a better mindset just to get through my sentence and get out there and live my best life, which I'm doing now. So everything I was doing, I was just doing to better myself, both physically and mentally. And I wrote all these ideas down, jotted them down. I thought to myself, you know what it is? I hadn't even thought about this before. I just thought I'm going to write a book. So it took nine months to actually write the book. And uh, as soon as I got released, I started writing the book. And it's been a massive success. It has for me. Because this year, 2023, I was scrolling through Google and I found my book. I typed in my name behind the bars with this fitness and it popped up on one of these pages. In the top 10 fitness books of 2023 which was a massive achievement for me, but my book's been getting sold worldwide. But if you all want a copy of it, go down in the description, click on the link. You can get it off Amazon or you can buy it direct from me and I'll even personally sign it. But um, that was my time throughout the prison system. And in total, I've spent over six years altogether because my IPP, I'd done just over five and then I'd done over 13 and a half months on my recalls. I've spent over six years in prison, which is enough to get a degree in prison. Because I know a couple of people have mentioned before, saying, well, is that all you've done? But believe you me, if you if you go to prison and you've been in for six and a half years, five years on your first time, it's a long time. Especially three years, surviving three years in a cut in a cut year, high security prison, and coming away with all the different stories, because a lot goes on in three years. But um, yes, I think I've covered a lot here about my time in the prison system and the people that I met along the way. But um, I hope you've enjoyed that, people. I know you said you enjoyed the last one when I was talking about different people that I met. But there is a lot more people that I met in Franklin because like I've mentioned, over three years and two wings full of lads with around about 100 on each wing. So you've got talking about 200 prisoners and in the three years when they've been getting rotated around and people coming and going, I've met 
to over 200 prisoners in a high security prison. And I've, maybe, I've probably only mentioned about 30 names altogether, not even that. So if you are wanting a part three and you want us to mention a few more people that I come across, I could even mention the ones that were doing the longest tariffs or the ones that were the most dangerous or the most disruptive. I will do another part three if you want. Drop it in the comments and let us know. But remember, people, if you are enjoying the content, remember to like and subscribe. Enjoy the rest of your day, people. Take care.